Hello, my name is Jonathan Cocker. I am an environmental lawyer with the law firm of Borden, Ladner, Gervais. Uh, welcome to our energy transition series. And today we have a, a fascinating guest, uh, Trevor Brown, who is the executive director of the Ammonia Energy Association. Uh, he'll be joining us today to talk about all things energy uh, in the ammonia space. And, and welcome, Trevor. Thank you very much for having me. Right. And, and Trevor, can, can you tell us, uh, just, just so um, our, our attendees will know uh, a bit more about uh, ammonia energy, can you tell us a bit more about what the, the association does, what its, what its objects are, where, uh, how, it's, how it's positioned uh, to promote ammonia energy in the marketplace? Absolutely. Uh, so the Ammonia Energy Association is a um, global trade association. Um, that exists to advocate for the responsible use of ammonia in a sustainable energy economy. Uh, so there are two parts of that mission, and that mission is is entirely uh, grounded in, uh, in in climate change and and uh, reducing GHG emissions. Um, but there the, there are two parts of it. First is ammonia is a, a very important chemical. Um, it's it's the, uh, it's what makes all of nitrogen fertilizers, which feeds half the planet. And, um, and so we make a lot of it on this planet. We make it from fossil fuels today and ammonia as a chemical. Um, we make 180 million tons of it per year. Um, and that produces almost exactly 1% of global greenhouse gases, just in the production of ammonia. Um, uh, we, we emit most of the carbon dioxide from that uh, um, fossil fuel reformation process. Um, I should add that the most of that carbon dioxide is coming off natural gas or coal in the production of hydrogen. And hydrogen is the input to the ammonia process. Hydrogen is combined with atmospheric nitrogen to make the ammonia molecule, uh, NH3. So ammonia as it exists today is half of the global hydrogen market more or less, and 1% uh, of global greenhouse gas emissions. So what we need to do is uh, is address this, you know, very hard to abate sector. We need to decarbonize ammonia production. Um, this is this obviously we need to be we need to be moving beyond um, fossil fuels with with unabated emissions into a into a different technology pathway, whether that is through carbon sequestration, whether that's through um, uh, using renewable energy and, uh, and electrolyzers pr to produce uh, renewable hydrogen um, or through alternative pathways. There are, there, are, there are many different routes here, whether you're talking about pyrolysis or, or stripping ammonia out of wastewater. There are lots of different ways you can go here, but, um, but the, the, the supply side of the equation is we need to decarbonize ammonia in the long run. Um, if we could do that, however, if we could decarbonize ammonia, you would have a molecule that is a liquid uh, at, at fairly ambient conditions. And um, it would have a lot of hydrogen. In, it. in fact, it would have roughly 50% more hydrogen than hydrogen does, um, speaking you know, in, in volumetric terms. So in, in the amount of energy you could fit in, a, for example, a fuel tank or a storage tank, you'd have twice as much energy or 50% as much energy using ammonia as you would with hydrogen. And so when you get to that point where you've decarbonized the molecule, you can then open up really interesting new sectors of the economy that could be using ammonia, um, whether this is uh, a sector like um, um, international shipping or, uh, or power generation um, or, 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 or other uses. So that's the, uh, that's, the, that's the broad mission. The, the association right. itself, we were founded in 2004. Four. Um, back then, this was a purely academic exercise. Nobody was taking this particularly seriously um, from a from a commercial perspective. Um, that, of course, you know, the, the the climate change and energy transition narrative has changed significantly in the last uh, twenty years. Uh, we relaunched as a trade association in two thousand and eighteen. Uh, we currently have one hundred and twenty two corporate members. Um, and that membership is international. We, we're doing a lot of work to 
build connections between people who are trying to figure out how to decarbonize bits of their economies. Uh, and that membership is cross-sectoral. So it's bringing the fertilizer people together with the, um, with the renewables people, putting the maritime people and the hydrogen people in the same room, getting the electric utilities into the room. It's really about connecting the full value chain so that we can accelerate the energy transition for these hard to decarbonize sectors where, um, yeah, that's what we do. Wow. Well, and, and you raise a, a fascinating point, and, and, and that is around energy density, right? And, and a, for those of us who um, uh, come from other than a, a scientific background, uh, the, the idea that the energy density in an ammonia molecule has more hydrogen than pure hydrogen is, is something that um, uh, re requires, uh, you know, a, uh, s s some, some deep understanding. And I think, I think when we look at ammonia, as an energy, we have, uh, at least in recent times, we have thought of it as a carrier of hydrogen uh, at first instance. Um, in other words, not so much as a fuel in and of itself, and I, I want to get to that, but, but, but when we look at it as a carrier of hydrogen, um, what are your thoughts as to, as to how it can be deployed in that capacity alone? Well, so with uh, with ammonia as a way of of moving hydrogen what your your one of your challenges with hydrogen well, actually, let me just step back and do do an even bigger picture um, before you even get to hydrogen but you know the first thing you're going to do in 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 this energy transition is you're going to use as much energy efficiency as you can so if you're for example taking the taking a you know the 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 the, the case of maritime um, shipping, you know, before you start talking about which molecule you're going to use, you want to say, well, what are my efficiency options? How can I, how can I improve hull design and, and, and wind assist and, and really be make, making sure that we, in fact, decreasing the amount of fuel we need to use in a, in a ton kilometer. Um, once you've done that, then you're going to electrify everything, assuming you have enough electricity. Um, and so for, for again, with the case of, of shipping, you're going to be doing cold ironing. And so that is when you're when you're at port, you're not burning fuel in an engine at port. You're plugging in, like like you would with your Tesla. You're going to plug in the, that container ship um, to the port uh, electric grid, and that's going to be far more efficient than burning fuel on board when you don't need to be. Then you get to that moment where electricity is not going to work because you're doing something that is. Um, too far away is going to be going for too 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 great a duration has too large a storage need. Um, the energy density of batteries, the the ability of cables to deliver power in the way that that is required, often uh, hits limits where molecules are are simply necessary. Um, and at that point, you're going to use hydrogen. You're always going to use hydrogen if you can. But hydrogen is a it's a it's a tricky molecule. It's very, very small, and it creates problems for, um, for handling and, and, and management. And all of those problems can be overcome at costs. And so what you end up with is a molecule that works very, very well if you're going to be using it locally um, immediately. If you have to store it for a long time, that's going to become very expensive. If you have to move it any significant distance, that's going to be very expensive. And so the moment you start to say, well, I, I need this molecule in my energy system, and I also need to be able to store it. For example, for if we were talking about seasonal energy storage, we, you know, we, we need to store it for six months. Um, if you're talking about a container ship, you need to have a, a, you know, a bunkering uh, infrastructure that... Uh, isn't extremely expensive. You need to know that once you've put your fuel into the fuel tank, it's not all going to boil off. Um, and so when you're talking about the sort of um, storage and transportation, a sort of supply chain, um, that's the moment where you're not talking about hydrogen anymore. You're talking about hydrogen based. So whether that molecule ends up being methanol or ELNG, or RLNG or, or, or ammonia, uh, whatever your pathway is 
uh, and whatever your your molecule ends up being, that, that's that's sort of where you fit in with hydrogen. Now, for ammonia as a hydrogen carrier, what you have at the other end is a cracking process that's going to crack your ammonia back into atmospheric nitrogen into an inert, um, completely completely uh, harmless 78% of the atmosphere, um, and H2, which is going to be your fuel. And that is not a very well understood process. The, the mature technology set for ammonia cracking, because we, we do massive quantities of ammonia cracking around the world all the time for processes like metal refining. Um, but you don't need a very high purity hydrogen for those processes. Whereas for a PEM fuel cell, you need 99.9999% ISO certified purity hydrogen. Uh, and that is um, quite difficult. So not only are you cracking ammonia into an ammonia hydrogen mixture, you're then purifying that mixture at, uh, at, at cost. And then you end up with, with uh, very usable hydrogen. The other option is to say, well, I don't need a purity hydrogen because maybe I'm in fact using uh, my hydrogen in a in a turbine, not in a PEM fuel cell. Perhaps I'm using it in an alkaline fuel cell, um, um, or perhaps I'm using it in a solid oxide fuel cell. You look at different technology pathways, and you realize well, you don't need such a comprehensive cracking solution. You can have a you know a little less less um, effective, much more economical cracking solution that, um, that enables ammonia to be a much more competitive hydrogen carrier. And people are just beginning to understand these, these use cases, you know, when they talk about, mm, we need to be importing 10 million tons of hydrogen into Germany by 2030. Uh, what does that actually, you know, what are they going to use all that hydrogen for? Is it all going into PEM fuel cells? In which case you have one kind of requirement, or is it going into a into a hydrogen gas turbine? Um, in which case you might want to say, well, why not just use an ammonia gas turbine? And I think that's sort of where your next question is going: is at what <laughs> point do you want to take that energy yeah. penalty of having to crack ammonia back into hydrogen instead of just using ammonia as your fuel? It's all it's all hydrogen energy. Um, but you can combust ammonia um, perfectly well. Yeah, and, 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 and let me ask you about that, because I think that's been really the sea change, uh, uh, you know, in, in terms of what we're now seeing in terms of new projects, right? We're seeing, we're, we're seeing industrial parties, we're seeing uh, equipment manufacturers, among others, saying, wait a minute, uh, why are we wedded to hydrogen in its pure form? When, as you say, it's a, you know, the, if it is a hydrogen product, uh, it has that energy, but we can work with uh, a form that may have uh, better transportation, uh, lower cost storage, more effective storage. Um, and, and maybe if you could describe, Trevor, uh, what were those sort of key, uh, key moments along that transition from, from kind of uh, H2 carrier to uh, renewable fuel in and of itself for, for ammonia? Sure. Well, um, this this really the the very very influential piece of um, piece of work was being done by the Japanese government um, from two thousand and fifteen to two thousand and eighteen. I think it was the SIP Energy Carriers Project, um, and they were looking at how to um, how to get enough hydrogen into Japan. Japan is an energy importer. It's always going to be an energy importer. Um, so even in, uh, in a deep renewables scenario, they need to be figuring out how to import those renewables. Um, and so what they what, what they were looking for is how do you get hydrogen? They've got three carriers they looked at: liquid hydrogen, um, uh, MCH, um, which is a, a sort of toluene um, carrier, and uh, and um, ammonia. And they did all of their numbers, and and uh, and you know, in fact, in fact, all of these options are fairly similar from a from a economic feasibility perspective. There's there's pluses and minuses, pros and cons for for each of them, depending on 
um, the sort of operational metrics that you'd be looking at, but um, but they're all fairly similar. Uh, but that was on the assumption that you would have to crack the ammonia back to hydrogen, which is um, probably you know roughly a, a sort of twenty five percent energy penalty. So that's a big chunk of your of your business case goes on on decomposition. Yeah. And they were looking at this and they said, well, wouldn't it be much more effective if what we want to be doing is power generation in a in a in a power plant so that we can have a, a you know a low carbon grid from our low carbon molecules uh, wouldn't it be much more effective just to burn the ammonia uh, and then they did those numbers and and you know all of a sudden ammonia becomes a, a significantly more competitive way of importing hydrogen molecules for low carbon electricity generation and so at this point, we've, um, um, we have, I mean, since, since um, for, for the last month in, 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 in the month of August, um, JERA, uh, the, the biggest utility in Japan has been combusting ammonia in its, uh, in, in its power plant, doing tests on what those boilers um, need to look like. IHI Corporation is, is developing the boilers. By 2024, they're gonna be burning ammonia in a gigawatt um scale power plant um and this is uh this is displacing coal from the power grid so this is coal co-combustion um yeah. with ammonia so they're you know 20 percent ammonia by energy content in a gigawatt scale power plant is roughly half a million tons of ammonia per year that's the sort of numbers that go into their import um plans that they've published in their in their um clean fuel ammonia roadmap um and the technology set that is coming out of that project is fantastic now we've got we've got announcements um of of projects that are and, and technologies that are available in, in the us now of uh you know mitsubishi's uh 40 megawatt ammonia gas turbine um they just uh mitsubishi also just put out a, a, an announcement about uh a hundred percent ammonia boiler technology that they're developing, um, yeah. and one of the one of the things I should say here is even um, you know research institute like EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute, has been studying ammonia, and what they what they realise is ammonia is a terrible fuel. It doesn't it doesn't want to burn. It's got a cold flame. It's got a slow flame. It's it's like a lousy fuel. It's really hard to burn. Um, and hydrogen has got all of the opposite problems. Hydrogen is too much. It's yeah. too fast. It's too hot. It makes all of this knocks because it's just massively hot. Um, and it's really hard to control. But if you mix the two together, if you make a ratio of 70% ammonia to 30% hydrogen, you have a, a mixture that mimics the fuel property of methane. It mimics... The properties of natural gas so in a in a in a gas turbine very similar to the technology set that is you know running power stations around around um, the world today um what you have is an ammonia tank um and then you go into a cracking process but it doesn't need to be a complete cracking process it's uh, just a you'll probably just yeah. recycling some waste heat from the turbine to um to partially crack your ammonia into a 70-30 um, ratio of ammonia and hydrogen. Yeah. Yeah. And that's and 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 that changes everything, doesn't it? I mean, in terms of ammonia as being uh, you know, so, uh, b being a fuel in and of itself, right? And and being not just uh, something that can be a mix part of a mixture as you say in that, in that Jira uh, facility, but also being the principal driver of a turbine, being a you know, be, being yes. the fuel energy source, and, and 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 let me ask you, what's what's been happening around fuel cells? Do we have do we have ammonia fuel cell technology? And if so, uh, will that compete with hydrogen fuel cell technology? And, and where where will we see this as maybe an, an alternative? Sure. Well, so so there are many kinds of fuel cells. There's um, PEM, which is which is um, an acid 
base-based technology. Now, ammonia is a base. You know, it's, a, it's an alkali. So when ammonia gets into a PEM fuel cell, it poisons everything. And uh, that can be a very expensive mistake because uh, you have to replace all your fuel cells. Uh, so um, removing tiny, tiny trace amounts of ammonia is essential if you're operating a PEM fuel cell. But if you're operating an alkaline fuel cell, uh, and so there are a couple of companies that, that have um, commercial or near commercial products. Uh, one would be AFC Energy in the UK uh, or GenCell in Israel. Um, GenCell uh, a couple of months ago put out uh, um, an announcement about the fact that they've been running um, at a at an emergency uh, transponder uh, like cell phone mast in, in Iceland for the last uh, six months, they've been running a, a, an ammonia fed alkaline cell system, providing providing backup power and, uh, and and base power for that for that cell phone mast. And so that kind of business case is really good for something like ammonia, where you want the ability to store it for a long time. It's just a, you know a big old fuel tank that's going to sit there and provide six months worth of power to a to a fuel cell doing a you know providing resilient um, power to 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 a sort of infrastructure you know or distributed um, um, power source. The the sort of market that AFC Energy talks about uh, displacing is the, is the diesel gen set. So if you think about all the construction sites around the world where they're there. You know, running temporary diesel gen sets, or even, you know, the backup power for for your hospital or for your um, data center. Um, the vast amount of diesel we burn around the year um, for the purposes of resiliency. You know, when when the grid drops out or when uh, when when we need backup power. Uh, those are excellent um, use cases for an ammonia fuel cell. Um, I would probably um, not suggest that we should be rushing into transportation with ammonia. Ammonia is hazardous. It is um, a toxic chemical. You don't really want to have it uh, everywhere being handled by people who haven't had training. Um, it is it is a substance that's very well managed, very well understood. We've got 150 years of of know how on on how to manage those risks, but making you know I I, I it is of course feasible to put it in a passenger vehicle, but I I wouldn't um, I wouldn't think that that's your first step. I would uh, for all the for all the risks inherent in hydrogen, I would I would sooner have a hydrogen fuel cell than a, than an ammonia fuel cell in my car. Sure. Um, sure. That said, um, you know, then you've got then you've got um, technologies like solid oxide. Now, solid oxide fuel cell doesn't doesn't really care what fuel you put in it. It's going to reform anything into power. You could you could put natural gas into it. You could put uh, methanol into it. You could put hydrogen or you could put ammonia. Um, and there are some very uh, interesting um, demonstrations uh, and technology pilots that are happening now. Solid oxide fuel cells are a little less um, technology, you know, technology readiness level uh, compared to something like PEM. But uh, for example, the Viking Energy is a um, is a vessel that uh, serves offshore platforms in the North Sea. And they're converting at that. Um, this is a project run by Equinor and Isovic um, with uh, with low carbon ammonia that will be provided by Yara. Um, they're converting that vessel to run on solid oxide fuel cells, um, ammonia fed. And so that's going to be, off the top of my head, I think that they're five megawatt fuel cells or two megawatt units. Um, I, don't, I don't remember exactly, but this is all public record stuff that you can look up. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, this is another, the solid oxide technology is another technology that's coming down, down the road and, 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 and quite quickly and quite visible. Yeah, and and you know it, when you talk about the marine sector, so you know international shipping, marine shipping, um, you know we look at uh, ammonia, and it seems to have a, a lot of momentum um, as as perhaps the the prefer, preferred fuel. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on 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 w whether that'll ultimately uh, be the case. And, and I guess we're talking about long distance 
marine uh, shipping. And and maybe maybe Trevor, if you have any thoughts on where methanol uh, might fit in with this equation, because of course methanol is also something that the marine sector, I think, I think has been looking at, albeit with a, a carbon a carbon molecule, right? But nonetheless, I think it's uh, it's it's worth looking at as well to see to sort of understand how the two may coexist, perhaps within this space. You know, I don't think that um, anybody knows what the coexistence is going to look like. Um, how I don't even know how to describe the use case where ammonia is preferable to methanol or methanol is preferable to ammonia. Um, but these are two molecules that are both um, very similar, you know, very, very similar energy density um, between methanol and ammonia. Uh, methanol is slightly more energy dense, but both are more or less, you know, 50% versus uh, heavy fuel oil or, or diesel. Um, so, so both both methanol and ammonia have to have to get over that hump of we're going to need a bigger fuel tank, and therefore we're going to have fewer containers on the container ship. Um, with uh, methanol, probably in the long run, the challenge is going to be um, understanding how to source carbon dioxide. Because when you make the methanol molecule, you are uh, taking your, your hydrogen for what presumably we're talking about in the, in the long term, we're talking about renewable hydrogen, either bio-based or, uh, or from electrolyzers. And, um, and then adding carbon dioxide to that. And um, so that needs to be clearly understood in terms of not just the, um, not just the carbon intensity of that, and is it delivering emission reductions that the IMO and other agencies are going to require, but also the cost of that. You know, how, today, carbon dioxide is cheap. No, <laughs> we have too much of this stuff. But in 50 years, is that going to still be the case? Is, is carbon dioxide going to be this plentiful resource? Or are we going to be having to get all of it from direct air capture? In which case, it's quite an expensive feedstock. Um, and so that's, that's probably the long-term um, issue that, that's going to be the, the sort of difference between um, ammonia and, and methanol is ammonia yeah, you're attaching the, the hydrogen to, to nitrogen, which is 78% of the atmosphere. Nobody around the planet has any different uh, availability to nitrogen. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's easy to get. Um, and um, the, there are some, some toxicity issues with ammonia that need to be, need to be um, addressed. You know, they're, they're very well understood in certain sectors. But those need to be translated into the maritime sector. Um, so, for example, we, we use ammonia as a refrigerant. So, um, all over the world, um, in almost every city, so, so wherever our, our listeners are, are, are sitting, is probably a cold storage unit at a, a supermarket or an ice rink or a, a, a food storage plant uh, or a food processing plant that's using ammonia as a refrigerant. Um, and that means that you've got probably you know, a few tons of ammonia um, sitting not in a nice tank where it's safe, but in a complicated machine that spans floors and vast amounts of area um, where ammonia is going through phase changes. Uh, liquid, gas, high pressure, low pressure, hot, cold. Um, and uh, that is going through space where people are working. Uh, enclosed inside. And these are all the sorts of scenarios that make ammonia dangerous. Um, you know, as a, as a, you know, you, know, you, you don't want to be trapped inside with it. And so you have a really significant quantity of uh, regulatory and technology mitigating things that, that help you to make these ammonia systems safe. Um, and so this this is a sort of example of none of that exists, of course, in the in the maritime industry. And so the maritime, the people who design ships need to translate all of these codes and regulations from the refrigeration industry and from other applications to understand um, 
from a from a ship designer, shipbuilder perspective, um, you know, crew management, um, how to make sure that those are going to be uh, safe and healthy environments for people to work in. Uh, that's yeah. probably the 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 perceived challenge for ammonia in, in maritime. From a technology perspective, uh, methanol is is a couple of years ahead. We do have methanol ships on the sea. Um, burning, uh, burning in, in, in beautiful vast engines. Uh, we don't have a single ammonia energy uh, ammonia engine on the sea today. By 2024, we will. Um, we, we we already have a pipeline of vessels that have been announced that will be converted. Um, we, you know, new new announcements are coming out every couple of weeks these days on another vessel that's going to be converted. Um, yeah. An interesting final comment just on on, on this one is that. You know, we do transport a lot of ammonia around the world. We ship about uh, 18 million tons of ammonia in gas tankers. Um, and these are ships that go from one ammonia tank to another ammonia tank. So if we're talking about concerns like fuel availability or port infrastructure, um, these are very low hanging fruit for yeah. um, conversion. And yeah. this is what you're seeing now is uh, you know, last month we saw an announcement from from fertilizer producer Nutrien and Exmar, which is a which a, a commodities um, energy transporter. They 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 have a fleet of ammonia tankers already working together to to put a vessel on the sea. And so you can you can see the the sort of low hanging fruit here in in terms of really deploying vessels. Of the the ammonia tanker being being the first choice, and for for context, um, if you're if you're going that route and you converted all of the all of the ammonia tankers and gas camp tankers, uh, you could be talking about two percent of the global fuel mix um, for for the maritime sector, and that's a that's a very significant number. Uh, not just in terms of being able to decarbonize 2% of a problem, but in terms of being able to commercialize the technology set that allows you to get on with decarbonizing, you know, when ammonia is never going to be, you know, 100% of the solution, but whether whether it moves to being 20% of the of the fuel mix or 40%, you know, um, these are, the, there's, a, there's a very clear pathway for how to get started here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that existing infrastructure, I mean, that seems to be a, 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 a familiar refrain that, you know, this this is one of the reasons why ammonia will continue to be relevant in this space um, in ways that perhaps other other fuels, because it, it it starts to feel like a crowded space, uh, amazingly, the alternative fuel space. I'd, you know, I mean, it was only a few years ago that it, it started to exist, uh, really, and now it's oversubscribed to perhaps. but. Um, I wonder one last question, and, and this is something that uh, is sort of focused maybe a bit more on Canada, but um, it, we in this country like to talk about how we're going to be a hydrogen exporter, maybe a top three uh, world producer of hydrogen um, and to provide to uh, provide that hydrogen to external markets. I, I'm wondering if you can if you have any comments on on how that might work, uh, whether it's a, sort of a blue ammonia, uh, perhaps going east, uh, sorry, going, yeah, going east from the west, or whether it's the reverse, we, you know, we might have a green ammonia from the e from the east going uh, further east. Um, I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on how viable that might be. And, you know, is this something that that those of us in Canada should look at as, as a potential uh, export product uh, with some, with some, rep, you know, significant revenue behind it? Yes. Yes, I mean, of of, of course, uh, I think Canada has um, a bunch of different things that that are very much in in favor of um, 